today. My name is uh, Dan Barrett and I am the Vice President of Greater Toronto Area Council and today I'm uh, going to talk to you briefly about um, an initiative that uh, our Area Council is uh, attempting which is sort of an outreach to treasurers. And what we're focusing on here is the um, Bill uh, C-377 which, which changed the way the Income Tax Acts treated unions. So as an overview of um, the, the bill. I'm going to start off by just going over uh, what some uh, some folks have uh, put out on it. This one here is by the Canadian uh, Centre for Policy Alternatives. Uh, two Saskatchewan academics have argued uh, that the 2011 Nanos Research Poll commissioned by uh, Labour Watch does not accurately reflect the public's opinion about the need for unions to disclose information about their finances. You know, as a treasurer, you know what you you know when you look at uh, meeting the the requirements of your uh, component or in the case of directly chartered locals the uh, PSAC uh, region so uh, the accountability mechanisms that are that are available to us are pretty straightforward and you know uh, Revenue Canada already uh, you know accesses uh, a lot of what's happening in the union uh, the public uh, disclosure of some of this information really is only uh, designed to do one thing and that's to expose uh, the, the financial vulnerability of unions to employers so that they can be exploited more effectively. Um, so the, and that's not necessarily in the public's interest because, uh, you know, you've, you've got uh, friends, family who work for unions and um, it's, you know, to destroy the union structure is not going to help uh, the economy grow. Uh, a lot of unions fight for not only the rights of their members, but for all working because they tend to set the standard at which non-unionized companies uh, basically, you know, offer uh, their own employees so that they won't unionize. Um, now, the, the other one, uh, when you read the uh, Canadian Labour Conference's letter to uh, senators explaining why Bill C-377 should be quashed, this is in the final hours of, of a Conservative government and essentially, uh, you know, this particular bill should not have passed the Senate, uh, all things being considered. Uh, the uh, Conservative Senators actually changed the rules uh, to allow this bill to pass because as a private member's bill, uh, there's no limit on the amount of debate that this particular bill uh, would have seen. And in the um, normal uh, running of a government where um, you know there are problems with the bill, uh, this bill would, would not, it would have died on the order paper. So even the, uh, you know, the, the Globe and Mail was pretty sure that this, uh, this bill was not going to make it. But um, it was pushed through and as such, uh, you know, when uh, the Liberal government in, during its campaign was promising to repeal it, um, you know, that needs to be done so soon. Uh, so we're hoping that's going to happen within the first 100 days and uh, we're looking at trying to encourage treasurers to engage with their uh, members of parliament to make sure that they are aware that uh, you know this kind of uh, legislation is insulting to the way in which uh, locals manage their funds and the way unions in general operate um, and it essentially uh, needs to be addressed so that uh, unions can actually do what they're intended to do which is create a check and balance in industry to make sure that workers' rights are, are respected and that, um, you know, the effectiveness of uh, work is not uh, overcome by a, a drive for efficiency and profit that uh, in the short term um, undermines the stability and uh, long-term ability of an organization to function. So when you're looking at uh, Bill C-377, uh, uh, just as an overview, uh, the bill was uh, uh, last introduced in the 41st Parliament, uh, the second session, which ended in August 2015. Uh, this bill was uh, previously introduced in the 41st second, uh, first session. So it's one of those bills that, that has been, ar been around uh, a couple of times, but uh, each, you know, previously in the, in the first session, it. Uh, it was uh, it died on the order paper because it just was not ill conceived. So they've tweaked it. They tweaked it a couple of times, and, and finally they pushed it through uh, in this 41st uh, Parliament. Uh, it was introduced by uh, Conservative member Russ uh, Heiber, uh, introduced as a private member's bill. So um, 
bill has received royal assent and is now law. Uh, it enacted amendments to the Income Tax Act to require that labor organizations provide financial information to the Minister of Public Disclosure. So essentially, what that means is that um, you know the finances of uh, unions were to be treated differently than the finances of any other business in Canada, uh, so that uh, its finances basically uh, get sent out to the public. And you know, as the previous slide was talking about, this is not consistent with what uh, the, the Canadian public is interested in doing. It's interest. It's basically uh, you know one of those uh, interests of the corporate taxpayers. So the bill is an act to uh, amend the Income Tax Act. Uh, uh, with respect to requirements for labor organizations, and that's uh, section 41 of the Income Tax Act. So when you actually look at uh, the, the legislation itself, you're seeing essentially that um, labor organizations are, are now being required to, on top of the, the regular income tax that uh, a business might be, might be required to do, at six months after the end of each fiscal period to file with the minister uh, an information return for that year in uh, prescribed form and containing prescribed information. Uh, when you look at the information that they're looking for, a set of financial statements for the fiscal year um, going to include a balance sheet showing the assets and the liabilities, right? So how much money do you have in your war chest? Uh, of the labor organization or labor trust made up as of the last day of the fiscal year and a statement of income and expenditures for the labor organization or labor trust for the fiscal period. Now this stuff is, again, this is all on top of what's already being reported to Revenue Canada. So, you know, it's like you've created, it creates an additional administrative burden, especially for smaller uh, unions or unions that are just trying to start out. Uh, essentially creates a barrier for the creation of new unions and, and, it, and just adds an administrative burden for existing unions to, to make it harder to operate. And then on top of that, it's dis disclosing uh, information to the employer uh, that they, the employer can then use against uh, the union. So, you know, when, when uh, you get these kind of requirements for the union to pro provide that to the employer, you know, like this is no longer a level playing field in any way, shape, or form. It's stacking the deck. So um, you have a, a statement of income and expenses, a set, uh, a set of statements for the financial uh, period setting out the agreements, amounts of all transactions and all disbursements, uh, a book value in the case of investments and assets with the transaction and all disbursements, the cumulative value of which in respect of a particular payer or payee for the period is greater than $5,000. So every transaction over $5,000, uh, you're going to have to do a report for this. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's that's obscene. Shown as a, a separate ent entries, uh, along with the name of the payer and the payee. So you're talking about making public record uh, every transaction that a union makes where uh, somebody is paid $5,000. So any action where, um, you know, uh, some business is providing product to uh, the union now becomes a, pub a, member, a matter of public record. So uh, any competitive advantage that some organization may have uh, when they, whenever they deal with the union, all that transaction is going to be made public. Uh, and this is in the, inter in the interest of industry? Uh, I don't know about that. A statement of accounts uh, received, a statement of loans exceeding $250 receivable from officers, employees, members of business. So God forbid somebody ends up in a uh, financial uh, difficulty and they need a loan from the union. Uh, that now becomes a public record. So, uh, you know, because we, like that kind of a, that kind of a, a provision essentially is uh, designed to humiliate people who actually have to take loans uh, from, uh, from a union. Uh, it's not. It's not meant to kind of to help people. It's it's meant to actually uh, create further deterrence uh, from unions being able to help people. Statement showing the sales of investments and uh, fixed assets, including a description, cost, book value, and sale. 
statement showing the purchase of investments and fixed assets, including a description of cost, book values, and prices, a statement of accounts payable, statements of loan payable, a statement of disbursements of officers, directors, trustees, employees, with compensation over $100,000, and to persons in positions of authority who would reasonably be expected to have in the ordinary course access to that material information about the business operation assets or revenues of the labor organization or labor trust. So that so the, the you know this item this item seven, a statement of disbursements of officers, directors, trustees to employees with compensation over a hundred thousand dollars. This is starting to, to sound like a sunshine list for uh, for unions. So you know, it's where, where you actually have uh, the interest of the public to know the Sunshine List, it's because it's being paid for by taxpayers' money. Uh, in the case of, of, a, of a union, it's being paid for by members uh, who are basically supporting a, uh, a union in order to represent them. You know, unions don't have a vote in Parliament. They're not, uh, like the representation that, that unions are doing are, are for workers. Um, but they're not there to represent the interests of, uh, you know, corporate taxpayers. This stuff just goes on and on and on and on. And it's like, you know, um, a statement of disbursements on lobbying activities. Um, you know, this these kind of things are already they're already covered off. A statement of contributions, gifts, and grants. A statement with the uh, with the aggregate amount of disbursements on administration. A statement. Statement of reasonable estimates of the percentage of time dedicated by persons prefer, uh, referred to in sub article 7 in each of the political activities, lobbying, and non labor relations activities. Statement uh, with the aggregate, uh, aggregate amount of the disbursements to employees on contributions, including gross salaries, uh, stipends, uh, periodic payments, benefits. You know, if corporations had to had to uh, you know create uh, records to that degree, they would go bankrupt. Um, you've got uh, you know statements on aggregates amounts of disbursements on labor relations activity, disbursements on political activities, disbursements on lobbying activities. It just goes on and on and on and on. The, the you know the the value of of uh, of this of this type of uh, information um, you know is microscopic compared to the uh, the administrative nightmare that it creates for unions. So now we get to the interesting part. So uh, after uh, reporting all this, you know, reams and reams of information, uh, you know, despite Section 241 of the Act, so everybody else in the in the, in Canada uh, is covered by 241 except unions. Okay. Um, so they have to report this information in return referred to subsection 14901 and shall be made available to the public by the minister including publications on departmental internet sites in a searchable format. For greater uh, certainty, a disbursement ref referred to in any of the subparagraphs including a disbursement made through third parties or contractors. So essentially, you know, you know, the conservative government had an issue with the gun registry because it you know, created some complex uh, database or something. Can you imagine the the, the database going to be required for this kind of stuff? So, and then we and then we get to the fun part, which is the punitive aspect of the bill. So, every labor organization or labor trust that contravenes section one forty nine hundred one is guilty of an offense and uh, liable to a summary conviction of a fine of a thousand dollars for each day that it fails to comply with this section to a maximum of twenty five thousand dollars. So, you know. This is obviously, you know, trying to bankrupt unions, and uh, that's not necessarily that is not in the interest of uh, of the union, and it is not in the interest of the public. So, uh, you know, as treasurers, we're we're asking you to uh, reach out to your MPs, let them know how you feel about this legislation, and uh, encourage your members of Parliament, especially if they're Liberal members of Parliament, to follow through on their commitment to repeal this particular piece of legislation and get Canada back to a place where unions can do their job uh, you know, as an effective check and balance against a corporate agenda which may not necessarily serve the interest of, of workers or the public. Thank you.